This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, so the title is, I guess, already confusing, Learning Circles and the I Work Ladder Ride. So I'm an engineer, so it would be very easy to put me in a box with nice square sides, you know, made up of lines. And it, it's also, also very tempting to think of our education as linear, as a line. You know, you, you start out as a freshman, you take some courses, and you, and you build, and, and eventually you graduate as a senior, and it's linear. And so I, I threw the word circles up here to get you thinking about how maybe it's more complicated than that. Um, and then the I work ladder ride, I should define the abbreviation. Ride is research, invent, design, empower. I had a student give me this um, at graduation last year, and uh, it's one of my favorite sayings has been that it's a short walk to the edge of knowledge. She turned it around, and I'm wondering how many of you noticed that there's an interesting word inside the word knowledge. Yeah, what did you see? Yes. Yeah. So what's funny is <laughs> I. <laughs> so you're a lot smarter than me. I, I, I had been. Uh, talking about this phrase for, for years and had never made that connection. And then when she created this little graphic and gave it to me, it's clear that those shoes are about to walk off the edge, and there it is. So anyway, it's a short walk to the edge of knowledge, and that's part of my philosophy, and if, or something that I believe dearly. And my sense is if, if you think it's not a short walk to the edge, or if you haven't gotten to the edge, you've not walked very far. Uh, I think in any discipline, you don't have to go very far before you get to the edge, where there are things that you don't know. And I think uh, letting our students know that is really important. You know, it's, it's very tempting to let our undergraduates think that we know everything, and it's more fun to let them know that we don't know everything. I've been doing Agua Clara since uh, 2004, 2005, and so trying to figure out how to talk about it is one of the challenges because it's, it's like everything I do. So I'm going to give you three slices, a perspective from Honduras, um, a, a global perspective, and then a Cornell perspective. So in Honduras, the problem that we're working on is there are, there are water supplies where Honduras is mountains, okay, everywhere, mountains everywhere. And so almost anywhere where there's a human settlement, there's a mountain that's higher. And there are streams up there, and the, the rainfall in Honduras in many places is, is half decent, and so there's often streams that are running year-round or springs. And so what they do is they go up in the mountains, they find a spring or a little mountain stream or maybe even a, a river, depending on where they're at, and they take a pipe down to a distribution tank and then onto the town. And so you get water out of your tap in your household. And do you know about Millennium Development Goals? Yeah? Okay. So Millennium Development Goals, one of them says that we should reduce by half the fraction of people that don't have access to improved drinking water, and we just met that goal. Okay, and that's really cool. Except that the word was improved, and this is improved because it comes out of the tap in your house, even though, even if it's river water, okay? And Agua Clara is working on solving that problem of having dirty river water coming out of your tap. We think that's actually not safe. We know that's not safe. Um, and even though I understand why it is considered improved, it's not the, the end goal. Um, so what we've done is we've developed technology that would treat that water. And since 2005, our partner in Honduras and has built these plants, eight plants in seven locations. You, you think I can't count, it's okay. There's seven pictures up there. Um, here's what a plant looks like in a, a CAD drawing. And my little bragging here is this is the result of I don't know, 10,000 hours of, of Cornell undergraduate and a few Master of Engineering students writing code so that you can go onto our website and request a design for a plant. You give it the flow rate that you want to be able to treat, and you get this CAD drawing, and it's generated automatically. So the technology that I don't know of other places where they're doing that kind of automated parametric design that where everything, th everything scales the way it needs to scale to handle the flow rate. This is now the real thing, looking at inside one of our plants, a 12 liter per second plant, serving four villages, four poor rural villages in uh, southern Honduras. 
Here's another picture of plants. What we do is we take very dirty surface water and we turn it into clean water. And we do it all without electricity and it seems amazingly simple. And in a sense, it is very simple. And as part of doing this, we've done an awful lot of research in our labs to get a better understanding at a very fundamental level of what are these processes, what controls how well they work, and how do you make them faster and more cost effective and easier to use from the operator's perspective. Okay, that was a slice of what's happening in Honduras. And then let's go to the global perspective. So here we are at Cornell. Here we do investigation, innovation, education, and design, all of those things. So Agua Clara R&D here at Cornell. Um, we are in the process of forming Agua Clara LLC. That is a business that will um, provide the educate, sorry, that will provide the engineering services for the partners who end up building these facilities in country. So Agua Clara LLC will, will work globally and provide services to partners who work at a, in a country or maybe even in a region in a country at building these facilities. Um, and then go down one step further, there are the, the organizations that actually operate the facilities. So it might be a community elected water board that runs the water treatment plant, collects the tariff, and makes sure that uh, hires the operator. And then there's the people at the bottom, the people that drink the water, okay? Uh, this makes it look like this is all a hierarchy. And I'm tr a little bit troubled by that, so let's mix it up. So here we go. Um, so it's really like this. They're, we're all there, we're all interconnected, and we all talk to each other, and there's sharing of knowledge. And I, I, I get really excited about feedback. Feedback is how you learn. Um, we were talking about, are your kids an experiment, right? As researchers, when you have children, are they an experiment? And, <laughs> and, and either you acknowledge that they are, or you pretend that they're not, um, because of course they're an experiment, right? If, if you're a child, do you want to be experimented on by your parents? What's your answer? No. Or maybe yes. And here's a pitch for yes. Because if your parents don't admit that they're experimenting on you, it means that they won't learn when they screw up. Right? That's what feedback does. You learn based on your mistakes. And so as, you know, when I teach, I, I often admit to my students that they're guinea pigs in this situation, right? I'm experimenting on them. I'm trying out educational techniques on them. And I'm intending to learn from that to make sure that I can do it better the next time. So maybe being experimented on isn't such a bad idea, I, within reason, okay. Okay, feedback. So I get really excited about feedback. Feedback is one of the reasons that Agua Clara plants in the real world produce cl clean drinking water and why many of the other technologies that have been put forth have not worked nearly as well. And it's because we use feedback. We learn from our mistakes and we make them better every time. And we look at what causes systems to fail and hence how do you eliminate those failure modes the next time around. And I don't know, this arrow could go in either direction. There's communication that's happening. Is it connecting? Like, it means that if a plant operator in Honduras has difficulty running a plant, there are mechanisms by which I will hear about that. And that could turn into a research project for my students to figure out how to fix that problem so that it's easier to operate. Or on another story, um, we were designing a new layout for our water treatment plants. And we send a CAD drawing of this new layout to Honduras to our implementation partner. And the technician at that organization, not the engineer, but the technician looks at that drawing and says, ah, but that's not gonna work because, and he gave me some reasons. And he was absolutely right. It would have worked, but it would have been unfortunate for the operator. So I got feedback, and so we never ended up making that mistake. We never ended up building that design because before it was built, we had feedback. Okay, so that was two slices. That was, that was, what do we do first? Honduras. We did Honduras, okay. And then we did like the big picture. Oh, we didn't do this part. So all these guys, so there's one of these, there's one of these, uh, well, okay, there's a couple of these, right? Cornell's around the world, but really there's, there's one in Ithaca. <laughs> um, sorry, Geneva, right? <laughs> okay. um, and then uh, their implementation partner. So there's one partner in Honduras now, and we're spinning up another partner in India. 
Um, and there's, it will eventually happen in other countries as well. So there will ultimately be many implementation partners around the planet that are building Agua Clara plants. And then each of them will be working with multiple water boards, and each of them will be working with many customers. Okay, so it just, I guess it's a big pyramid scheme, but hopefully in a benevolent sense. Okay, so now at Cornell. So this is now getting closer to the nitty gritty of the program, and this is where you can start thinking about how might you generalize this. Oh my goodness. Okay, so there's research, invent, design, and power. How do I want to talk about this? Oh my goodness. Okay, so a freshman coming in can take my introductory course. It's an intro to engineering course. And right off, we mix things up. Because in that class, I call it a design class. A freshman design class? Does that make any sense? How can they design when they're freshmen, right? Like our pedagogy says, you have to wait until your seniors to, to do, do design work. At least in engineering, that's why we think of it. So anyway, I call it design. And they actually design and build a lab scale water treatment plant that is computer controlled and that produces clean water and they have sensors to verify that it meets US drinking water standards when it's done. So they do that in small teams. And, and I know that they don't understand everything that is all the theory behind it, but I give them a taste of that, of the different theories, so they have a little bit of a sense of what's going on, enough that it makes sense to them by the time it's done. So this is doing things completely out of order. And I think it's really important because then later on when they take a theory class, they've already seen it and they know I'm not pulling their leg about how things work because they've seen how this worked and they, they know what was important in making the system work. And then the theory makes more sense. I'm, this is the circles. Like, um, fluid mechanics is, one second, fluid, fluid mechanics is one of the hard courses in, in engineering curriculum. And I've always said, you should really take the course twice because the second time around, there are things that are taught at the beginning of the course which will now make sense to you that didn't make sense because it, you went down a line and the stuff in the beginning, you just couldn't figure out how to wrap your head around it. But after you learned the stuff at the end, you can come back and it makes sense. And I think all of us who've gone through multiple levels of courses, there, we've, we've experienced that where things that didn't make sense now begin to make sense. Yes? Yeah, how many credits for that uh, one, one, so one? This is a three credit course. This is a three credit, actually everything's three credit, okay? Um, so freshmen do this. Juniors or seniors can do this. I actually had a sophomore do this once, and she did great. Um, all out of sequence. Um, okay, then over here is the project. So this is where students are working on the project. They're doing research or design work, doing research in the lab. And there are graduate students. There are project courses that are for um, freshmen and sophomores who have not yet taken or juniors who have not yet taken this course. And then there's a, a senior level course that is for people who've already taken this theory class. They're in the same project, but now they can get design credit for working in the project. Whereas these folks, they don't actually get any credit that's worth anything. Okay, sorry, <coughs> they know that. Um, and then there are Master of Engineering students who are taking the course or the project for their design project. But what I do is I, I wrap a circle around that whole thing. And students from those three entryways into that course all come to the same room. We all meet together. And then we split them up into teams. And we split them up into teams very carefully. Actually, and I don't do this. I delegate this to my team leaders. They figure this out. They split them up into teams. And there are mixes of uh, student abilities, mixes of ages of students or location in their degree program, all mixed together um, to create these small teams. Um, okay, there's also a summer internship at Cornell. We have this great program. It's no money, no credit, come work for us. And what's amazing is, <laughs> is that students do this. Uh, we, we have like 20 students come and work every summer um, as part of this. So it's amazing what you can make Cornell students do. Um, Sorry, that I know that half of you are Cornell students, so. <laughs> okay, and then there's an engineering and context course where I take about 20 students to Honduras for two weeks during the January intercession. Um, this, currently there's no credit for this and it's not officially connected with any courses. It's just something cool to do and I see it as an integral part of the program. Uh, I have on here, I've pointed to this time in Honduras as learning 
And I've pointed to this stuff as service just to reverse things for you because in the service learning model, you tend to think of what you do on campus as the learning time and what you do at the project site as, as service. And I actually think in, in this case, it's more reversed. They're doing the useful things that will help our folks, our partners. They're doing the useful things here at Cornell. And then when they're in Honduras, they're mostly learning. Um, OK. Anybody want to ask a question about this? Oh, one more thing. Don't tell my director. Wait, can I trust this many people? Um, but I, I give two lectures per semester in this course. <laughs> that's not per week. That's two per semester. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's team time. It's time to work in projects. I think it's time for some pictures. No, it's time to go alt tab. Will this work? Yes. OK, so this is the, the wiki for that project course. And I, we divide up into teams. So I didn't want to make another PowerPoint slide, so I was lazy. So here's all these topics that are currently being researched. And each of those would link to another wiki page where they're, they're, they'll describe what they're doing. And they'll be posting their, their reports as they, as they work during the semester. And there's a little blurb about each of them, which you could read on forever. Um, so the, the point is, that's what's happening in that course. Students have a design challenge or a, a challenge that they're working on, a research challenge or a design challenge. And they're working on that for the duration of the semester. And they're, um, they're writing reports every couple of weeks. And we're evaluating them. And who evaluates them? OK, so here's a teams of three to five. I said some of this before. Range from developing new theories, optimizing performance, developing new fabrication methods, creating design algorithms, all those things are happening all under this overarching create safe drinking water. Uh, the leadership structure. OK, so I'm director of the program. And uh, I describe this as servant leadership. So my job is to provide the resources so that the team members can be successful. So that's there. There are undergraduates, graduates, and faculty who work together to provide feedback to individual teams. I have undergraduates who actually read some of the reports and evaluate them and give them back. I have um, a graduate student who's doing some of that, and I'm doing some of that. We share the load between us. Um, I have student leaders who organize the training sessions for the tools that are used. There are, there are research tools that we've created over the years that make it possible to automate the operation of experiments. And it's one of the ways that make it po makes it possible for students who can't spend 40 hours a week in the lab to actually do meaningful research. So they can automate their experiments. And so they have to learn how to use that automation system. And so my students create the tutorials to train the new students coming in how to use that system. And I don't do any of this. My students do this. Um, my, I have a student leader. She creates a syllabus and says what's happening on each day during the semester. And she tells me what to do. She says, you're giving your, t your talk on this day. Um, and th that's an undergraduate, by the way. And she's been, she's been great. She's been doing it for the last two years. Um, and then the, the graduate students have a completely different experience, too. I tend to have about two graduate students, only two, for this program. And they end up having this experience of basically being a pro managing a program. So they get to do what faculty normally do. Normally, faculty run a research program. My graduate students effectively run a research program where they have multiple students working under them, under them in a servant leadership kind of way, um, working on different research projects. Symposium. So in the middle of the semester, we have this symposium system where we used to do PowerPoint presentations, and we all sit there and watch them. And we realized after a while that that wasn't the most effective way to learn about what each of the teams was doing. So the point of this symposium is that you want an opportunity for all of the teams to figure out what all the other teams are doing. So there's sharing of knowledge between teams, because they're doing very different kinds of things. Each team is a very different kind of research. So they give short presentations right next to their experimental apparatus. So they can actually point to it and explain how it works, demonstrate it. Um, and they do it in, in relatively small groups. And we end up spending four um, class periods, four 75-minute class periods, to rotate all the teams through all the stations so that everybody gets to 
tell everyone else what's going on and also gets to see all the other um, teams that are doing their thing. So that's another example of peer-based learning. This is now going to Honduras. So some pictures from Honduras. Uh, students getting to see the Aguacolada plants, getting, getting to talk, interview the, the operator, find out what works, what doesn't work, what kind of problems they've tended to have, um, and just fully engage. Um, and another thing that we do. So this is where um, the learning and service are really closely tied together. So this is a, a filtration system that um, students had developed over the previous semester, and now they're attempting to deploy it in Honduras. And the goal of this is, it's not going to be used yet. It's in the, it's, oh no, and it, it's, it's going to be, it's like a, this is like a first deployment. Let's try it and see what happens. And why do we do it? It's so our partner in Honduras can see what technologies are that we're working on. Um, and it'll get their ideas spinning about, well, where might this kind of technology actually make sense in their context? And they'll give feedback to us. And, and given that this was the first time we deployed this filter, it also had problems. And so we get feedback about what failed, and that goes back to our lab to fix the next semester. So that was one example. Um, we also get to look at our plants, and we get to see how they, how they work. Um, so this is looking at a sedimentation tank, and they're taking it apart, and our students are getting to see how this really looks. Um, they had opportunities to see pictures and to see AutoCAD drawings you know, in previous semesters, but they all comment that there's nothing like actually seeing the real thing and seeing how it all fits together. Okay, <coughs> this is now the world that many of us live in where there's, there are these three spheres. There's research, there's teaching, and there's service. And Marsha made it clear that apparently I'm doing something that is a little bit uncommon. It, I hadn't fully realized this, but this is what I did. I took them and I sucked them all together. And and I think I confuse my director sometimes um, because he's like, is that research or is that teaching? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> Actually, it's a, it's a real, like there's accounting issues. I don't know, there are accounting issues that drive them crazy because like, well, was, was that research or teaching? Like, well, how, how would I know? I mean, it was research that's part of a course, so what's that? Okay, so there it is. Community scale drinking water is, is what I'm working on and what has been my focus for the last eight years, and all of it fits underneath that. So a few reflections. It's hands-on learning. It's mixing up application and theory. So many of our students are incredibly highly motivated to do something to make the world a better place. And if you can tie, tap into that, you've got a really powerful connection. Um, you, can, you can make them work hard. Not make them. You can invite them to work hard, and they will deliver. Um, they provide an amazing volunteer workforce. Uh, yeah. So does it work? Um, so four papers per year published in decent journals um, over the last two years that are research results coming out of this. Um, lots of students engaged, in the, 20 students in the summer, 35 students in the fall. Um, this is in the, in the project courses, and 55 students in the spring. Many inventions were open source, which makes it, Open source is so efficient because when you invent something, you just throw it on the web and you're done. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to talk to, to CTEC. You just throw it on the web and nobody else can patent it and anybody can use it and you're done. Um, I, I think that labs that are so tied into making sure that nobody else can use it, they end up wasting a lot of time making sure that happens. Um, this is simple. Um, our students write their reports and at, when they re write their reports every two weeks, those are immediately posted on the web. So stuff that they're um, developing during the semester is protected from somebody trying to patent it right away. Um, so, okay, we have many inventions. We have a new theory for flocculation. You don't want to know about flocculation, but anyway, we have a new theory for that that's, that will eventually hit the press. It's going to take a little bit of work to debunk old theories. There's 30,000 people with safe drinking water in Honduras. There's an Agua Clara LLC spinoff, and I think we have an incredibly cost-effective research model in that we can generate lots of results with a few graduate students and on uh, a tight budget.
This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.